Hi, this is Abuela T. Belly. Welcome to the show. So we don't give up. What's up, YouTube? It's me. All right. Here's your world. It's me. It's me. T. Belly here. Beautiful. Hey, what's up, YouTube? It's me, your guy, T. Belly here, King of Retro with my top 10 video games of all time. Now, before I get into this list, this is going to be a two-parter. It is going to be freaking epic. Ocarina of Time is running wild. Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection is running wild. What's going to make my top 10? We shall see. So, just a few rules. We're only going with one franchise. Only one franchise. I mean, sorry. One game in each franchise. That's what we're going with. So you will not see two Mario, two Zeldas, two GNG games. We're not doing that. It's not that type of top 10. I'm really proud of my top 10 because we fared really well in the ratings department. Sometimes people put a game in their top 10. And it's a game that's literally rated like a 6 out of 10, a 2 out of 5. But it's like, oh, I love this game. It's one of my favorites. Meanwhile, the game's not that good. And it's like, that's really in your top 10. That's really in your top 5, top 20. Well, I'm proud of my list because there's no garbage games in my list. You might not like some of these games, but there's literally, statistically, no garbage games in this list. Shout out to Gaming Off The Grid. Wes and Robert, they tagged me back in December. These guys are literally... I mean, at least from my point of view, they're like the premier retro gaming channel. They found a way to take such a topic like retro gaming, something that's been on YouTube for over a decade. We've seen it all, and they find ways to make things fresh. New ideas, hot topics, cool topics, interesting topics, amazing streams. Not to mention, as much as T-Belly hates the Wii U, I kind of like the Wii U now. Thanks, God G. Thank you, guys. And again, thank you, guys, for the shout-out. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to do that. Shout-out to Night Shame. Miss him. He was an awesome content creator as well, Night Shame. But we're going to get into his list right now. We're going to do 10 to 6 because Wes wanted me to get into these games. So we're going to start with my number 10. Okay, guys, number 10 for me is Streets of Rage on the Sega Genesis. I had a complete inbox copy, and I sold it. I needed some money. I said, hey, you know what? You can go. I actually have right to the left of me, I have the Sega Genesis 6-pack, but the label's gone. So I'm not going to show you a blank Sega Genesis case. But Streets of Rage is my tenth top 10 favorite game of all time, number 10. This game has a metacritic score it actually made it to metacritic which is going to be crazy some games on this list are not on metacritic a metacritic score of 8.4 so that's pretty damn good anything that's like an eight or eight and up it's pretty much something you should play so why streets of rage here over so many other beat em, other beat em ups i mean games like double dragon 2 streets of rage 2 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time, games like that. Why is this game here? Well, this game showed me as a little boy that look what a beat-em-up can be at home on your console. I was used to beat-em-ups on NES, but when I got my Sega Genesis and I was introduced to Streets of Rage, the Yuzo Koshiro music set it off for me. Learning the controls, C is to jump, B is to attack, and A is to bring the police, or should I say the police correctly, the police come and they shoot a rocket launcher. And if you have two players, the second player's police call will actually send a bunch of rockets, like a bunch of missiles. It's really awesome. You can only do that with two players. This game had attacking your partner in the game. So many moves where you can literally grab your partner, fling them at an opponent, and they'll go do some flying diving attack really awesome really awesome game they had the back attack and again yujo kashiro and his music dudes i cannot get over how much fun 
how great that soundtrack is. Now, Streets of Rage 2 is a phenomenal game. And I know most people have it higher than Streets of Rage 1. Well, number one, I never owned Streets of Rage 2. Number two, when I did rent it, I thought it was good. But for me, it wasn't good enough to want to buy it. I was fine with Streets of Rage 1. Me and my brother always beat it together. I actually beat it for the first time in probably the past two or three years. I beat it for the first time on my own. I've always beaten it with my brother. We used to play a lot of games together. So Streets of Rage, that's my number 10 game of all time. It's a series that I love, adore. It's my favorite beat em up series of all time. Till most recently, we got Streets of Rage 4. I own that on the Nintendo Switch Physical on the PlayStation 4 Digital, and I need to go get the Mr. X Nightmare physical version, which has all the DLC on one cartridge. I'm going to get that on the Switch and put it in my Streets of Rage 4 Steelbook. I know that's cheating, but I want it complete. I want to know 10 years from now, when I grab that case, I got the complete Streets of Rage 4 experience, even though I like playing on the PS4 more, but that's another story. But thankfully, with the power of Nintendo Switch Online, we can use Sega Genesis controllers, which also brings me to the fact Streets of Rage is playable in so many formats. You can get Genesis controls by Retrobit, play it on your PC, on your Sega Genesis collection for your Switch, Xbox, or PlayStation 4, and actually use Sega Genesis controls. It's phenomenal what you can do. And if this game wasn't important, if this game wasn't that good, they would not be releasing that game to this day. So, on to the next game. Number nine. Super Mario Odyssey. Okay, so here we go, guys. Super Mario Odyssey. This game has a Metacritic of 97. It was really hard for me to pick between Mario Odyssey and Super Mario 64. Mario 64 is special to me. I have it complete in box. I actually do not own a physical of Odyssey anymore. I traded it in to get my PS5. I'm actually looking to collect the, and I'm taking long to collect this, the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller with the digital Mario Odyssey on it. It's a pretty cool collectible, a nice box, and it keeps the game in my digital library forever until my Switch breaks. So I need to go get that before it's like totally gone. And Mario Odyssey, guys, it took, you know, you had the Mario 64, Mario 3D games that started with Mario 64. Those games changed the point A to point B linear Mario games. It just totally changed it. It gave us a new genre of 3D Mario, which was mostly collectathons. Then you go to Mario Sunshine. You went on to Mario Galaxy and Mario Galaxy 2. And then it was a wow before we got a 3D Mario. Now, I know we have that third style of Mario, the 3D land in the 3D world, but those are not the same as the traditional 3D Marios. Those are actually a mix of 2D and 3D. So they're, they're like their own third genre of Mario. So we actually have like three different types of Mario games. We'll get into that one day in the future. And it's crazy how like it's been so long since Mario Galaxy 2. And obviously, sales had a lot to do with that. And Mario Galaxy 2, I've never played it. I own it. It looks phenomenal. And I feel like a lot of people were drawn away. I mean, the sales showed that people wanted new Super Mario Bros. Wii and not Super Mario Galaxy. I believe Super, new Super Mario Bros. Wii outsold both Mario Galaxy 1 and 2 combined. But with Mario Odyssey, the Switch was on its launch here. Hype Train... Breath of the Wild was like the hottest game on the console. It was up for game of the year. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe was a console seller. It's still selling to this day. And here comes Mario Odyssey with what felt like the sequel to Mario 64. I mean, I know we had Sunshine and the two galaxies. But Mario Odyssey just brought a mechanic with Mario's hat. Mario's hat is very, very important to him. And for him to be able to just grab his hat... And flick it at an enemy. And when he flicks it at an enemy and hits them, he takes their power a la Kirby. And it was crazy because Mario can turn into a character that can shoot, that can attack, that can do super jumps. I mean, everything, dude. 
all the way spoiler. If you have not played this game, here comes the spoiler. All the way to the very end of the game where he said, well, it's time to take control of Bowser to escape and survive. And you even take control of Bowser and dudes. Mario Odyssey was something that I we need a part two. This can't be a one and done. It cannot be Nintendo. No freaking way. No way. No way possible can this be a one and done. Super Mario Odyssey was a work of art. It was something that like you just you just never seen it before. You seen parts of it, but it was just the music, the gameplay, the controls, the graphics, the setting, the content, this post-game content. You go back to the Mushroom Kingdom. You go back to the castle of Mario 64 and you collect stars. I mean, this game had it all, man. So many gameplay mechanics, little 2D sections in the game. I mean, dudes, I can't get over Mario Odyssey and how much fun it is, man. It's just a fun game. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we want to do? We want to have fun. And Mario Odyssey delivers it all. And that's why it's my number nine. So time for my number eight. So guys, at number eight, it's on this console right here. I should have turned it on. <laughs> it's on my 3DS. I don't have it on the original Game Boy or Game Boy Color, if you prefer to play it on that. Pokemon Silver. Now, Pokemon Silver, <laughs> phenomenal game, but let me tell you guys, I'm recording this video in January of 2022. I started playing Pokemon in August of 2021. Now, let me rephrase that. I've played the older games, and as I'm talking to you guys, I'm gonna go pull up the game. To show you, I'm not BSing you guys. So, interesting fact. Uh, it started with my nephew. I have two younger nephews. Because my son's not a big gamer. But uh, my two younger nephews, the older one, he's a big gamer. He's very similar to me. And he said, hey, Theo, which is uncle in Spanish. And there you go, Pokemon Silver. Awesome game. Phenomenal game. And I'm not done with it yet. And I'll explain why I never truly beat the game. Not yet, at least. I'll explain that in a minute. Dudes, he wanted to play Pokemon Stadium. So I pull out the game. So my instinct is party games, the mini games. Mario's Pokemon Stadium mini games because I grew up playing Pokemon Stadium and Pokemon Snap. I did not play the Game Boy games. I was a little bit, I, I wasn't really older because some of my peers played it. But I was more into fashion, buying sneakers and clothing, not really video games. To be honest, I was rocking a Sega CD in TurboGrafx-16 back when everybody had was getting Saturns and PS1s. It wasn't until the N64, 1996, where I said, hey, mommy, can I get an N64 or Boombox for Christmas? And she gave me the greatest Christmas ever, and I got both, both an N64 and a Boombox. So I played those games. I tried out Pokemon Yellow, but I never got into it, never played it. Pokemon Go was something I was addicted to. And when, when we played Pokemon Stadium, my nephew said, no, I want to battle you. So I'm like, he must think he has a chance. Little does he know, I used to play this game. I bust his ass two out of three times. So he comes sometime that weekend or a week later, something. He says, hey, Theo, I got 10 bucks. Can you order me Pokemon Go so I can play it on my 3DS? I'm like, hmm. I know you need two games. I know all about Pokemon. So I said, you know what? Keep your 10 bucks. I'm going to buy you gold and I'm going to buy myself silver. And I started and guys, I was so addicted. And before I get into silver, I played silver. I played yellow. Before I played yellow, simultaneously on stream, me and my nephew played through Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and I freaking loved it. So I played through freaking that silver. Let's Go Pikachu yellow and I'm having a freaking blast and then Pokemon Brilliant Diamond comes out and Shine and Pearl and I, I literally cracked 101 hours last night in Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and as at the time of this recording Pokemon Arceus comes out this week uh, hopefully we can get this video out before that game comes out and guys let's go back to silver 
why I think it's the best one I've played so far. Uh, I probably, did I play another Pokemon game? Probably not. But, um, dude, Silver. It took, it literally is called the Johto Region. Johto Region or Jado. I think it's Johto. It's pronounced Johto. And it, it brought this nice adventure. Really good gameplay. You can use your phone. Everything Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow had plus more. So here's the kicker. You beat the, you beat regular Pokemon. You beat all the gyms. You get all the gym badges. And then you go beat the Elites. I believe it's the Elite Four. Some games have five. I can't remember because I played so much Pokemon in such a short time. And I was addicted to this. Not to mention collecting and training. So many things to do in this game. So when you beat this game, the post game says, hey, go across the water. In the beginning of the game, there's a river. So now you can swim. So I go surf across the water. Do you know where it brings me, guys? It brings me to the Kanto region. Kanto is Pokemon red, blue, and yellow. It brings me back to that region to collect all of those Pokemon that are from red, blue, and yellow. Some of them are in the Johto region, but some are not. And not only do I go there, I have to beat all eight gyms. I have to beat the Elite Four over there. It was crazy. It was like two games in one. I'm like, this was a bang for your buck. But it doesn't end there. It does not end there. You fight some of the characters from... Pokemon red, blue, or yellow. But here's the kicker. They mention red. Red is supposed to be like Ash Ketchum. Ash Ketchum is kind of based off red. Red is the premier character of the Pokemon manga. When you play Pokemon red, blue, or yellow, you, you use red, which I believe if you get blue, you pick blue. But he's the guy. He's like your Ash Ketchum. So they talk about him. And dude, after this amazing game, they had some whole thing where you get a legendary Pokemon. You get two legendary Pokemon. One, you have to get a special feather and do something special to find them. It's so crazy. But dudes, what really kicked it off for me with this game, what really put it above the rest, they sent me to go look somewhere in these caves. And who do I run into in the caves? Red. You run into red. So I'm like, holy crap, this is phenomenal. So guess what? In Pokemon Yellow, you have Pikachu with you, right? So guess who he has with him? With Pikachu. So I'm like, okay, let's fight. His Pikachu is like level 70 or 80, and he kicked my ass. He literally kicked my ass with his Pikachu, and guys, I couldn't be any more satisfied. Getting my ass handed to me by that Pikachu, because it felt so good, because like, well, the game's not over. I need to level up my Pokemon a lot more because outside of my legendary, which is probably a level 70 or 60, all my Pokemon are in the level in the 50s. I need to level them up because this guy red is kicking my ass and I can't beat him. <laughs> so this game was just an adventure, man. It was such an adventure. Pokemon games are so much fun. I hear a lot of crybabies complaining about Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Well, I never played the originals. So for me, it's a new experience. It's a fun game. It's a Pokemon style game. And like I said, I just clocked in 101 hours and Di and Brilliant Diamond. Shining Pearl, I'm actually working on trying to get a starter. Shiny starter. Shiny's a whole other breed. And, and this is how crazy Pokemon had it got with Silver. It introduced making eggs. It introduced shiny Pokemon, which are pretty much albino Pokemon. And they, they have a different color and skin tone to them. And sometimes they're stronger. It, I mean, this game has it all. So we're going to stop talking about that game. And let's get to number seven, man. Hey, what's up, guys? So for Pokemon Silver, forgot to tell you guys the Metacritic. There was no Metacritic for the game because it was too old. It was too old of a game. So what we did get was a Metacritic for Pokemon Soul Silver, and that got a Metacritic score of 87. But upon further research, IGN, the famous IGN, IGN gave Pokemon Silver a 10 out of 10. So now let's get on to my number seven game of all time. Right here, guys, we have Super GNG. &G. Super Ghouls and Ghosts. This is the Super Famicom version. I do have the American Super Ghouls and Ghosts as well as the Game Boy Advance version. Now this game got a 
it did not get a Metacritic score. Again, it's one of the older games. But what I was able to find for Super GNG was the GBA version. And this is the lowest score on my list. Unfortunately, it got a 78 Metacritic, but it is the GBA version. Now, upon further research, IGN gave the game an 8 out of 10. So I'm going to stick with the 8 out of 10 because it's the actual Super Nintendo version of the game. So Super GNG got an 8 out of 10. And, dude, we, we got some good scores on these games. Told you, it's not going to be uh, not gonna be too much garbage up here. Not going to be any garbage up here. Super Ghouls and Ghosts. This game is the premier Ghosts and Goblins game. Like, I know I have this one running in the background, which looks like it... Uh, Looks like it ended. <laughs> so we might want to replay this bad boy, right? Start this bad boy back up. But um, yeah, dudes, Super Goos and Ghosts. I mean, Sir Arthur, I love him. He's phenomenal. I'm, I'm heavily into the whole Renaissance medieval times thing. I mean, you can ask Do You Nerd. Shout out to Do You Nerd. They know I love that stuff. And I'm big on it. I can't seem to find a complete game. That gives me the experience I want from that realm. But Ghosts and Goblins is the closest. It's just really hard. Really hard series. So we all know Ghosts and Goblins was tough. Ghouls and Ghosts was tough. They were arcade tough games. The first game was ported to the NES. The second game was ported to the Sega Genesis. They were also ported other places. But we're going to stick to the main versions. Now Super Ghouls and Ghosts is an original home console game. Developed exclusively for the Super Nintendo and Capcom knocked this out the park, guys. I mean, the first thing they did was they removed the vertical. They removed the vertical from, um, what's his name? The vertical attack from Arthur, which was in Ghouls and Ghosts. Made the game a lot easier having the uh, vertical attack. It, to me, it made the game a little easier. And it's actually the easiest Ghosts and Goblins game is Ghouls and Ghosts. It's... Literally super, not super easy, but it's the one that any skilled gamer can most likely beat on their first try. It's not really hard, except the last level on loop two, pretty much. But Super GNG said, hey, we're getting rid of the vertical attacks. We'll stick, we're going back to horizontal, just, just shoot straight. If you get a weapon that can shoot in different directions, so be it, aka crossbow. But we're adding a double jump. So now you think, okay, the double jump? This is going to make the game a lot easier. Oh, no. The game is not a lot easier. The game was developed to use the double jump. There are literally situations where you might jump left and you might have to jump right while in midair to dodge some kind of bullet or something. The game is insane like that. Great graphics. Great soundtrack. Tight controls. And overall, just a great experience but challenging this game will kick your butt super ghouls and ghosts is not a walk in the park i mean this game is so tough i mean some people they just want this gaming validation people might even cheat and use like game genies uh game sharks use rom hacks just just to say hey i beat the game whatever floats your boat as long as you're having fun have fun but naturally the authentic super ghouls and ghosts game it is no joke, dude. It is no joke. They, like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, this game is tough. I still remember my first time playing. It took me forever to beat that first level. I believe the first time I played, all I did was get through the first loop. And once I beat that first loop, I said, all right, guys, we'll stream this again next time. And then the next time I got, you know, because it, it was long. I said, okay, we got through the second loop till you got to that final level. Dude, let me tell you, you learn this game. You master this game. You enjoy this game. But when you get to that final level on loop two, because we all know Ghosts and Goblins has two loops, this becomes a test of might. Because obviously, the main purpose of the second loop from Ghouls and Ghosts on in the series is that you need to get a special weapon to beat the final boss. When you beat the final boss in Super GNG, they will unlock a door behind them to a true final boss. It's not as easy as it sounds, guys. This is going to kick your butt because you need this specific weapon. You need to make sure you have the top armor you can get so your, your attacks are as strong as can be. And not only do you have this one behemoth, 
the uh, original boss from Ghosts and Goblins. But when you beat him, another guy comes out. So you got to fight two bosses. They're both tanky, extremely tanky. They take a lot of hits. And man, you can run out of continues. This isn't the other games where it's unlimited continues. You can run out of continues in this game. So I highly suggest starting on beginner or practice, whatever the lowest level is. It's all that does is it gives you more. It, it makes it easier for you to get more lives and more continues. That's all it does. It even max up the lives if you got to. But when you just press start, put it on normal or higher with your three lives and what you got. Good luck, cause this game is not easy. That final boss. This game is literally ranked the second hardest on the SNES. It's a tough one, man. But it's a fun one, and I even know specifically looking at the retro community of YouTube, I seen. Mega Dan 29, Captain Algebra, Phil Twerp, and Solid Nate, just to name a few that just grinded through this. And it was rough. Even when it was my turn to play, I was like, oh boy. I mean, oh man, that was a tough one, man. But the victory is all so sweet. When you beat that guy, when you beat that boss before the true final boss, it is victory because the final boss is a piece of cake. He is so easy. Just got to figure him out. It would suck to go to him with like just three lives left and you don't know what to do. But the final boss is a piece of cake. I mean, it shouldn't take you more than three or four lives to figure him out your first time and then just get him. Or do a lot of people do. Look up stuff online, how to beat it. But Super Goose and Ghost, classic game, the best in the whole series to me. Um, not as hard as Ghost and Islands Resurrection, hardest game of all time, but a very, very tough challenge. So now my number six game of all time. I mean, this is uh, pretty easy for me. I have to say this is an easy list for me to make. This game was not on Metacritic because the NES game, but this game got a 4.8 out of 5 from GamePro. GamePro Magazine gave this game a 4.8 out of 5, the highest rated in the series. Battletoads, oh yeah, Battletoads for the NES. Such a gem. This game will change your life if you truly play it. Most people follow walkthroughs. You're robbing yourself. You follow a walkthrough, you are robbing yourself. I'm telling you, I don't I never look anything up. I learn. I grind. I fall down and get back up. And eventually I win. That's how T-Belly plays. It is a great way to play. But whatever you want to do, whatever makes it fun for you, that's what you should do. But Battletoads is a game where I say, hey, practice makes perfect. Don't look anything up. Go for it, man. I still remember my uh, very last, my winning stream. I remember on level two, I'm playing and a YouTuber level one online said, hey, um, you know you can bounce off the walls, right? And I'm like, oh, um, I've only made it as far as this close to the Dark Queen, and now I was told that I could bounce off the wall in level two. Like, it's that crazy. This is what I'm saying. It's something you need to experience, grind, and train by yourself. I mean, I literally used to come home after work when I was playing this and give myself three continues. Like, okay, we're going to play. Well, give myself three turns, which is three turns is a set of four lives. And three continues, which you can get extra lives. And I used to run through that. And it got to the point where eventually I would just do one run. I wouldn't even use all my continues. I'd say, okay, I played enough. I got to go to sleep because I used to work overnight. And let me tell you guys, this was a grind. And this TV behind me, LCD TV, this is the reason why it took so long. The Klingelwinger was almost impossible to beat. Input lag. t Bell was playing with input lag. There's another game I'm going to talk about. So I literally beat Battletoads with input lag. I made it so much harder. And there's a CRT right here in front of me. But that CRT did not exist. So I played on this on original hardware. But yeah, input lag. It, it, it really kills you. But even without the input lag, the game is a grind. It's tough. But if you could get this on a CRT or... As least lag as possible it is a phenomenal game. Every level is a different type of challenge. From the beat-em-up stage of level one 
to the balancing going down the cave of level two to the beat em up slash turbo tunnel of level three to the platforming of level four like the game just has all kinds of stuff the snake pit you have um what's his name the uh i forgot the name of this guy but it's literally a level where you're riding a jet through the tunnel you got to go up this elevator shaft you're going through sewers i mean it's it's crazy the clinger winger i mean the rat race i mean the dark queen the dark tower dudes this game is has all kinds of stuff going for it i mean literally one of the greatest games i've ever played in my life and yeah battle toes is just something that is it is a gem in history man it is known mostly for the turbo tunnel and it's pause music but guys the turbo tunnel is nothing if somebody mentions the turbo tunnel they're just beginning the turbo tunnel is literally your first test it gets much rough the snake pit the jet tunnel i call it the jet tunnel the elevator shaft and when you beat when you meet robo manis i mean there's bosses in the game but when you meet robo manis now you met a real boss fight the rat race the clinger winger and then the dark cat the dark tower dudes still one of the most frustrating levels because it's so different oh man and then finally the dark queen who can kick your ass I mean, guys, this game has it all. I love the Battletoads. I'm a huge fan. One of my top 10 favorite franchises. But yeah, Battletoads is my number six game of all time. Uh, shout out to Wes of Gaming Off The Grid. He suggested, hey, I want you to speak. Tell us about these things. And this game just... This game just did it all. This game just did it all. And it's a game that I always wanted as a kid. Never Was never able to get it. And when I was finally able to get it, I said, well... I can get Battletoads or I can get a Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis. I mean, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Battletoads, you're going to go with the new console. But Battletoads is one I, I met, I found it in adulthood, and I said, hey, we're going to take this game on. And I did, and it was a journey. It was quite the journey. It was such a journey. Like, all over YouTube in the, in the retro scene, everybody was playing Battletoads games. Once, once I started playing that... Everybody started playing Battletoads games, Renaissance, Paul Tessie, Mega Dan 29, and Solid Nate all said, hey, we're going to no death run Battletoads. I mean, it got crazy. And then Xbox released a new Battletoads game in 2020. Like, it was, it was, it was pan, pandemonium with Battletoads. And it all started with T-Belly saying, hey, let's start this journey. And so many people were on the journey with me. And we took down... Most of the games, we took down Battletoads, Battletoads 2. Uh, I haven't taken down Double Dragon. I took down the arcade game. I still need to stream the uh, 2020 game, but we took them most down. We only The only one we're missing is uh, 2020 on stream, which I did beat. And Battletoads Double Dragon, I actually never beat it. I don't like it. Uh, oh, game sucks to me, but, you know, we got to beat it. I was close, too. So, yeah, man, Battletoads. Love it. So, yeah, guys, um... My top, my 10 to 6, there you go right there. And then now it's time to get ready for my top 5 of my top 10 games of all time. But I'll see you guys in the next video. That's it for today. It's me, your guy, T-Belly. And I'm signing out, guys. Cheers. And subscribe to the T-Belly Show. The King of Retro is back.